glaube, wie lange? Eine Viertelstunde? Eine halbe Stunde Pause. Jen Christiansen, vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mic on? Sounds like it. Great. Uh, well, today I'd like to talk about illustrating scientific concepts for a non-specialist audience. Let's see. I first presented some of this material at the Communicating Complexity Conference in Sardinia a few years ago, but I think that these ideas are particularly relevant for editorial designers. And I think it's worthwhile to revisit the topic here. To read more, um, you can see the blog post at this web address. Several years ago, I directed an artist to develop a dimensional drawing of a particle for publication in Scientific American magazine. A particle that, by the scientist's own admission, may or may not exist. And if it does exist, we certainly know nothing of its form, texture, or color. Yet I asked the artist to include all of those qualities. In theory, this sort of representation would have been more appropriate. As Connie Malamed writes in the book Visual Language for Designers, when viewing a high-fidelity graphic composed of superfluous elements, the additional information can overload working memory, acting as a barrier to comprehension. And as Edward Tufte famously put it, graphical excellence is that which gives to the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time, in the least ink, in the smallest space. Yet I had encouraged the artist to introduce unnecessary and fanciful details for an infographic that did not revolve around how the particle looked. How could I justify the disconnect between form and function? The top diagram is spare. Not too much ink, clean and to the point. The bottom diagram includes dimension, shadows, gradients, arbitrary colors and textures. But which graphic draws you in? As much as I like the idea of the top graphic, I find the bottom one more inviting. I argue that although unnecessary details might take some attention from communicating the main concept, the trade-off can sometimes be worth it. Fanciful illustrations can engage and inspire a reader, particularly when trying to make complex concepts accessible to a non-specialist audience. The trick lies in finding the right balance. Figurative details should assist but not distract from the main concept. Here's another case study, cosmic inflation. As an introduction to the subject matter, here's one of my favorite graphics on the topic from Nigel Houghton. After the Big Bang, there was a period of rapid growth of the universe, shown here in yellow. For an article in Scientific American, we needed to explain this existing hypothesis before launching into newly identified problems with that hypothesis. Here's one of Scientific American's earlier classic representations of the concept. It shows the size of the observable universe over time. The pink zone is the time of inflation. My original intention was to develop a series of graphics in which every color, shape, and line had meaning, nothing extraneous. The circles here represent the universe. Cyan represents the classic hypothesis and is repeated in each box as a point of comparison. Yellow encompasses the period of inflation, and magenta represents new ideas. I was so caught up in developing a spare and efficient language to explain the science that I had completely lost sight of the context for the graphics. These illustrations were intended for an existing audience that loves articles about space, and a potential audience that might benefit from a familiar visual hook as a welcoming counterpoint to the abstract concepts in the article. 
By stripping out figurative details, I had lost all visual references to space. And I may have pushed an already abstract concept even further out of reach of a popular audience. Here's how this series evolved, ultimately with the help of artist Malcolm Godwin. The spare iconography changed to detailed dimensional shapes. I like to think of the fanciful details as a welcoming gesture before blowing the reader's mind with complex concepts, sort of like a glass of wine along a more challenging plate of tripe. And that got me thinking about articulating different strategies for making that connection with a reader without compromising the information being illustrated. The bottom line, before you can even begin to communicate a complex idea, you must first engage an audience. Minimalist and abstract iconography might be the most elegant and efficient way to communicate findings within a research community, but that could be a captive audience. I suggest that this design approach can actually be off-putting to the non-specialist audience. If an information graphic does not incorporate immediately visible context, a familiar visual vocabulary, or a welcoming gesture for the non-specialist reader, it may simply confirm a preconception that the content itself is abstract and unrelatable, shutting down the opportunity to convey that information to a new audience. At this point, I should provide some context. I am not about to present results of a research project. The examples and opinions here are based on my experiences as the graphics editor at Scientific American Magazine, my time as an assistant art director at the magazine back in the mid-1990s, and a lot of time exploring the archives. This is not analogous to a paper on what makes a visualization memorable by Michelle Borkin and her team, which was presented at the IEEE InfoViz conference a few years ago. First of all, I did not run an experiment or conduct a survey. But also, I'm concerned with what makes someone want to spend time with a graphic, not what makes them remember it. What stops someone from turning the page and moving on to the next story quickly? And how can we use that to help them want to engage with and understand complex information. Scientific American represents a unique case study. Over 170 years of science and technology information graphics against a backdrop of a subtly shifting mission and ever broadening audience. It's the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States. It was founded in 1845 as a four-page weekly devoted primarily to inventions. Here are a few representative graphics from that first year. On the left is a small multiples grid that shows different signal patterns for a mechanical telegraph. On the right, a woodworking machine patent illustration. In 1921, the scope of the publication broadened changing from a weekly inventor's paper to a monthly periodical of popular science. The graphics started to explain broader concepts, such as this demonstration of the effects of different map projections. Now, I should mention that I later discovered that this figure was reprinted from a publication earlier that year uh, by the US Department of Commerce. The uh, link there brings you to the original. In 1948, the editors shift focus again. The magazine would now fill a gap between technical journals and popular science magazines. So it was a shift towards being a little bit more rigorously academic. These graphics are from an article on bacterial viruses and reproduction. When looking through issues from 1948 through the early 1980s, the consistency of style is remarkable. There's a slow evolution of the look and content over the years, but still clearly referential to the 1948 benchmark. At times, like with this illustration from an article on crystallography, the graphics were unapologetically academic. 
a visual reminder that this magazine took its content very seriously, and it expected its readers to delight in the complexity of the topics. This is echoed all the way up through the 1980s with images like this particle physics diagram that focuses on gluon pairs, or glue balls. Here's another example reflecting that minimalist tradition from 1993. I think it's safe to say that in the next few years, the pace of aesthetic evolution quickened, perhaps in response to the more rapidly growing offerings available online. But I think it was also due to the shift from traditional illustration tools to digital tools. An official shift in the magazine's aesthetics occurred in 2001. Highly produced photographs were much more prominent in the redesign issue, and the graphics are more notable for their visual richness than their informational richness. Like this example, in which the illustration is striking, but for all of its careful rendering, it doesn't really show very much. Complex stories are largely left to the text. Images seem to function first and foremost as entry points rather than primary content vessels. With the next redesign in April 2007, the imagery remained bold and consciously dynamic. But it's also apparent that infographics were once again kind of officially embraced as a medium to communicate complex information. But as time, at times, a bold styling overshadowed the information a bit, as with this illustration. Which brings us to the next redesign in October of 2010. An official description of the magazine included this sentence. The graphics are rich in content and visual style. Content came before style. Conveying information would be the primary goal, but it would still be critical to engage and inspire non-specialist readers with an inviting and rich style. Here's an example from that redesign issue. The goal being to honor the content and engage the reader. And now, on to some specific examples of infographics that make use of the three strategies I outlined earlier. Immediately visible context. Here's an elegant diagram that clearly shows expansion of some sort. But without the caption, title, or full article text, the reader has no clue that this is an infographic about the universe, specifically cosmic expansion. This image addresses the same topic, but it makes a little bit of a trade-off. References to speed and distance are dropped, but visible figurative context is added. The reader now has a better sense of place. This is an article about the cosmos, as shown by tiny galaxy clusters, and a clearer view of the implications over time. There is something intellectually and aesthetically appealing about the graphic on the left as an icon for cosmic expansion. But the immediately visible context in the graphic on the right helps to set the scene, providing a visual setting for the larger concept, as well as providing the casual reader with an engaging hook. A reader can picture themselves on a planet in one of those tiny galaxies in an expanding universe. To spark recognition and prime the reader for a less familiar concept, a graphic can lead in with a comfortable and familiar visual vocabulary. For an article on artificial photosynthesis, we started out with a really familiar vocabulary on the left, including imagery that most people can remember from their school textbooks. Then we used that same visual language to describe the new technology on the right. Silicon nanowires that can produce energy in the form of hydrogen from sunlight. 
sometimes, as in the case of, with this diagram that explains encryption, the familiar visual vocabulary reflects a metaphor introduced in the text. In this case, the algorithms used to scramble and then decode secret messages are referred to as keys. So I drew keys. In Scientific American, conceptual illustrations are sometimes used to, next to more descriptive, technical, and detailed charts. These friendly explainers provide an entry point for non-specialist readers without compromising the integrity of the main concept. For yet another article on cosmic expansion, a rubber band experiment helps to explain the graphs on the right. Here, two snapshots are shown of a rubber band pulled upward at a certain rate. The velocity of different points marked on the band is given by the length of the colored arrows, yellow, orange, red, and maroon. Those colored arrows correspond with the arrows in the first chart, helping non-specialist readers make the leap from real-life example to larger concept. In this case, a few playful details help keep the reader on the page and encourage them to think through the complex geometry. Relatable figures, like this spinning ballet dancer, and tiny figures struggling to lift the cube provide a whimsical touch without masking the content being illustrated. In fact, they reinforce the rotation direction helping readers visualize the direction in which the cubes are spinning. Now, information graphics should first and foremost convey information and honor the integrity of the information being illustrated. But within the context of Scientific American, it is also critical that they be engaging. We hope to inspire the specialist and the non-specialist reader alike. The trick lies in finding the right balance. These 1987 illustrations of the Gravitational Wave Observatory, called LIGO, are handsome and definitely informative. But what would happen if we turned the dial up a bit and tried a little harder to capture the imagination of the non-specialist reader? Well, you could say that the t dial was turned up a little too far here. The message of the graphic is a bit hard to find and navigate amidst all of the detail work. The welcoming gesture may be too aggressive. Illustration details are overwhelming the message. We tried turning the dial back down a little bit here for an article that addresses the same technology. The context is still pretty strong, but I think that in this case, the technical information is not overshadowed by the efforts to engage an audience. In summary, I suggest that by making connections to the objects and symbols already and stored in most people's heads, you can help encourage them to take the next step and push on to learn more. The first obstacle, immediate recognition, is surmounted and deeper engagement with the more challenging details can begin. As with this graphic, showing a basketball morphing into a football, morphing into a baseball, it provides an immediate hook. A connection is made with the reader through a visual analogy. And then you can move on to the weird world of neutrinos, in which particles really can morph from one type to another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.